Do you ever need to open an access database using VBA and avoid running any of the startup code? Let me show you how to do this. Hi, this is Adrian. I also go by the name of Neopar. I have an issue with my code documenter because when I just do an open current database and I give it a file name and path, if that database has startup stuff, it can screw my code documenter up. So what I'd like to do is bypass the startup stuff. Now I looked and got some code and tried to figure out what it was doing and this is what I ended up with shelling and using a no startup and a read only as switches on the shell but I think Adrian might have a better solution so I'm going to turn it over to you Adrian and maybe you can help me get back on my feet. Here's Adrian. I've got two things here first of all I'll go through the open a database and bypass the startup that's fairly straightforward I do have some code as well, which I'll get to later, and possibly in a separate recording, which makes a file read-only so that it doesn't change the date. That You're talking about that as well, so I'll go through that, but later. Mod OS here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new module in your version with all this in it. Well, I'll go into the details of what's what a bit later, but for now, I'll just copy it across, create a new module, which we will call mod neopar bypass. Does that meet with your um, approval? Absolutely. Okay. Um, if you want to add an underscore in it later, you know, I'm not too worried about how you end up with it. So I'm now putting that code in there, which will do the business. Right, and I'm now going to save. Oh, I'm not going to compile first. Everything compiled fine. So currently we have a compilable system. And I'm going to save that. The first time you save a new module, it always prompts you with that, even though you've given it a new name. So I want to get past that stage. So instead of the shell code I put in, what would I do then to use what you have just added? What I thought I'd do is briefly go through what is there and how it works, and then after that go through changing the code so it calls that. When we get to that stage, you'll have a much better idea of what I'm talking about when I say, oh yeah, we need to add this and we have to pass this parameter, etc. Does that make sense? Okay, thanks. You'll see that from the scroll bar, that all this preparation at the top, and we get just get down to the, the function declaration here, that's pretty well half of it. The function fits on a single page. It's got Windows API references, all to user 32. I'll just quickly go through those. Get keyboard state, that is saying... Tell me what the state of the keyboard is. Set keyboard state. This is the thing that actually changes the fact that you've got the shift key down. Set foreground window, set focus. They're both about making sure that the shift key, when it is considered to be down, is applied to the correct process. So in other words, it's got to be a shift key for the process we want. Get window thread process ID is converting different types of, you know, you get a window ID, but then you need the process ID of that window ID. That's what that gives you. Part of what we were talking about before about getting the foreground and the focus is you have to attach the two threads, the thread you're running from, the code is running in, and the thread that you're opening the database in. They have to be attached for that to work. So let's now get to the code. That's given you some very basic background. We'll go through the parameters because this is important. You've got strdb, that's a full path string of the database. If it's local, you can just give it the name, but it's basically something that you use to tell it which database you want. The optional exclusive when you open current database is down here. One of its parameters is exclusive. We just pass that on. So the user, the caller of open bypass can specify whether you want that to be exclusive when it opens. And the password again is passed in strpw. So if you have a password for the database, you can give it the password. And this returns an access application object when it finishes. So you're basically passing the same parameters that you'd pass to open current database, except this is going to do some fiddly things around it first to make it work differently. The first thing we do is we create a new access application. Sounds good. And, and this is great. Thank you. My pleasure. You First of all, it creates an access application. 
and then it has to make that access application visible. It can only work if it, at least it flashes the new application. Normally when you create object, it isn't visible to start with. The bypass thing cannot be used without making it visible, at least for the time it opens the database. Close it, you know, make it invisible afterwards, fine, but it does unfortunately have to be visible for that process to work. Then we're doing what I said before, if we come down to here, we have lung this and lung that. LNG, this, these are basically process IDs. Lung this is a process ID for the current Windows application. So application.hwindaccess app is the ID of the window, as in the access application window. Lung that is the same thing for the access application that we call open bypass at the moment. So with open bypass, .hwindac means it's that one. Get window thread process ID converts that information into a process ID for the thread itself. So we have lung this and lung that both set up with those IDs that the operating system understands. The next line after those two is to connect those two together so that they're logically recognized as being linked. Wait a minute. Can you go to the definition for attach thread input and explain what's happening? This is a function defined in user 32. My understanding of this is not perfect, but it's it connects the input as in the keyboard for the two threads. Does that help in your understanding or is that not? Well, I'd have to go to the web and research a bit more to give you any more. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to pull you off. No, not at all. I'm happy to share what I've got. And, and then Control Shift F2 gets you back to where you were. Control Shift F2. Oh, thank you. No, that's great. I use that. You're telling me that that is Control Shift F2. Correct. Marvelous. I love learning new shortcuts. That's great. At this point, we attach the thread input. So essentially, so that this thread, the controlling thread, can be aware of and can control the input for the other thread. Then we bring it to the other thread to the foreground because it's dot H wind access app, it's using the open bypass the other application, the one that we've created, not the one we're running from, which would be the same thing but without the dot. So set foreground window and I'm moving the mouse across. So set foreground with set focus. We are now in the position we want to be to fiddle with the keyboard. So first of all we say get keyboard state. The result is returned to us in an array of bytes, which is 256 bytes long, 0 to 255 array. That gets returned from the operating system, and it tells us the state of every single key. Now, I'm just going to go back to the top because I forgot to tell you something. At the top here, there's this con shift as integer. That is the offset, that's 16 or hex 10, that is the offset of a logical key called shift. There's a left shift and a right shift, but there's also a logical one, that, which is just shift. So if that's set, it doesn't matter which of the two shift keys is supposed to be set. That is shift set. That's what we're using. That works. First of all, we're saying BYT var equals A byte keys con shift. So we're saving the existing status of that key. Okay, happy with that? Can we look at the definition for A byte key? It's here above you at the top of the screen. First one on that line. Can you explain that a little better, Adrian? Okay, that's a simple array. It's an array 0 to 255. It's got 256 elements of byte variables. It's a simple array of bytes, or 8-bit character length variables, in an array of 256 elements. When you pass this keyboard state, if you pass the parameter as the first element of that array, which is what we're doing, a byte key zero is the first element of that array. What it's actually doing is passing the address of that element, which is essentially exactly the same as the address of the whole array. So the operating system, get keyboard state, is passed this address. It then fills up that character and the following 255 characters with information that it has, has about the keyboard. That's simply asking the operating system to tell us what is the current state of the keyboard? Once we've got past that, the con shift is what we looked at earlier, the hex 10. That is 16 in decimal. That is the relative position in the array of the shift key. And we are storing the existing copy of that in BYT var. So we're saving that for later when we take the shift key off. And then what we do is we set that same value in the array, the con shift one, to hex 80, which is essentially binary one and seven zeros. It's the 
high value bit of that byte. It's going to be set to 80 or 1000000 in, in binary. That's essentially changed the array. We then call the set keyboard state in exactly the same way as we did the get keyboard state. Everything exactly the same except for the shift. The logical shift gear is going to be set to hex 80, which means it's pressed down. Then immediately afterwards, it's very important that there is nothing, there is no do events, there's no anything between that and the open current database. We do the call dot open current database, and as soon as we finish that, we look at setting the shift key back. So we take the original byte var and put it back into the array, and then set keyboard state again, which then sets it back to how we found it in the first place. And then we have to detach the threads, which is using the same call attach thread input false and that detaches our control of that other thread and then we return to the caller the access application object. Does that make sense? So if I wanted to use this code I could simply call open bypass and assign that to my application object. Yeah. That is just so super cool. I love this. Thank you, Crystal. To use that code, I've knocked up a little template here which illustrates the things that have to be done to make it work. First, we dimension the access application variable OAP. The next thing we do is we set that by calling open bypass. In this case, I'm simply passing the full path of a database. Other parameters are not often used, so we'll ignore those for now. The next line, with OAP, that's a quick and efficient way of referencing that object a number of times without having to keep repeating it. Something I like to use and recommend. Next comes the code that your application is built for. Whatever it is that code needs to do, it fits in there. The application is opened, the database is there ready for you. Do what you need to do, and then it drops through into the tidy up code. After your code is completed, what you have to do is close the current database. So call dot close current database. That uses the OAP from the width. After closing the database, you close access. Call dot quit. The option I often use, it's AC quit save none. That means nothing is saved by accident. If there is anything that you need saved, save it in your code. At this point, nothing is saved by accident. End with finishes the width, then all that is left to do is to set OAP to nothing and you're back where you started. Okay, in the, the code that opens it, do you want it to stay visible when it's running your code? Well, actually I do kind of like that. Oh, fine, that's fine. Set visible equals true. That's how it leaves it, visible. This is great, thank you. Thanks for watching.